to Talking Art. I'm Jane Treger, and we're continuing our conversation with local artists, of which this valley has so, so many. Today, we're talking with Rob Chirico, who lives in Greenfield. Rob, welcome. Oh, I'm always good to be with someone who is such a promoter of the arts. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. No, because in this day and age, um, people are too obsessed with other things, technology and so forth, that someone really has a viable interest in the artwork and the people in the community. It's just, it's wonderful to be here. And here is the Deerfield Arts Bank, I forgot to mention. And Rob is in uh, the current show and uh, is having his own show. Um, and this will probably be shown around that time and the show is called just visiting Chirico was here that's it anyway so uh, Rob I like to begin by asking people where they came from and what brought them to this region oh mine was a circuitous route from growing up in Jamaica Queens in New York traveling to France and living in South America and eventually coming here Oh, I, it, it's been long, tiring. I'm glad I can rest for a while. It, that was not a satisfactory answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what brought you to this particular region. I'm glad you're, you've had all these journeys, but why Greenfield? Well, it turned out that my in-laws, who were very prominent art dealers, who were living between South America and France, uh, decided that they needed a pied-à-terre and Greenfield seemed like a lovely place and it turned out that they had a carriage house on the property that was a wreck and they said it's yours if you can fix it up and I thought well that's perfect so I came I fixed it up and we just love it here it gives me a chance to paint to write we don't live there anymore now we uh, live in an entirely different place but uh, but still to, to be able to to work at your leisure to read write and, and play your music as loud as you want is, uh -huh, is uh -huh. wonderful. So they chose a pied à terre in Greenfield, Massachusetts. That's a little unusual. <clears throat> well, this because they're probably unusual, but it turned out that their daughter was living up here and they came to oh. visit and they fell in love with the Pioneer Valley. Now that is a very usual story. People who come because some other relative is here, either yeah. the parents or the children. Or they could have read Ralph Nader who said this was one of the most splendid places in the country to live. That's lovely. Thank you. I think I had forgotten that. That's wonderful. I hope the Tourism Bureau picks up on that and uses it. Oh, maybe that's not useful. Well, Ralph Nader, I don't know. I don't, Depends on who's reading, right? And when things go a little bit slow, I often quote Mark Twain to say, it will make uh, the transition to death almost unnoticeable. That's quite different. It is quite different. But one must yes, add a little. As you can see, I'm going to have a really hard time <laughs> getting this man to talk. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, and and what? What? Your, I know both of you were in the arts. She was working at a, at a museum. Would you like to say how you met? Well, uh, yes, actually, it's a very amusing story. We were both taking a class at the Institute of Fine Arts of NYU uptown, and I was. I don't know, back then I guess I was a little more obstreperous than I am now. But I was walking with this lovely woman through the um, newly built uh, Robert Lehman collection. And I was just trashing it. Look, this place is too small. The art is no good. Well, how could they spend this money? And I said to her, well, what do you do? And she said, well, I work at the Lehman collection. <gasps> so we hit it off. <laughs> but the other interesting story about that is I went to bring her flowers one day and her boss was a little crazy and I had long hair and I wore this long black jacket and I came in and I saw he was just leaving so I was looking through the glass at his departure he was gone I went and put the flowers into her office and I walked out and he was following and he saw I had no package so Upon exiting the museum, the doors all closed behind me. He had phoned in a bomb threat. So I had the honor of closing the Metropolitan Museum due to a bomb threat and giving my wife flowers. Your future wife. Future wife. Of that's wonderful. That's, <coughs> that's quite a story. Of, <coughs> of 35 years. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Congratulations. 
So tell us. Valdina is her name, by the way. Valdina. <laughs> um, how did you, um, besides dressing like an archetypal artiste with your black coat and your long well, hair, I wasn't were an, you I, actually an artist? No, I wasn't. At that point, I had, um, you know, been one of those kids who could draw, loved to draw, and if I was sent to the principal's office, it was because I had a nice drawing rather than because I did something bad. And I decided I would become an artist. I went to a Catholic high school and they had absolutely no art. And so when I tried to apply to art schools, I didn't get in. So I took one course at Queens College in New York, a color course. I hated it. It's the only art course I've ever had in my whole life. But I went into art history. You mean art uh, as, a, as, a, as a studio art? Studio art. The only course I ever had was this color course. Instead, I went uh, to the direction of art history, and I worked on a PhD in art history. So you have a PhD in art history, and you taught? I taught for seven years in New York, and at one point decided, you know, I think I really should paint. And I just chucked it all and started painting and drawing. Really? You just <coughs> chucked it all in New York? Well, at that time, uh, we were living in Connecticut, but t I was teaching in New York. And then we moved up here, and I decided that a life of painting and poverty went hand in hand. I noticed that too. Mm. Yes. <coughs> okay. So, in other words, you've had one class in studio art, and from that you were able to produce this? No, I probably missed three quarters of those classes. But what happened was when I was at the Institute of Fine Arts, there was a conservation center, and I got to be chummy with the people, and the Metropolitan Museum was across the street. So in, in effect, the old masters were my teachers. I learned how to paint by uh, looking at their techniques, studying their techniques. Most of my technique, you would say, uh, is based on um, 16th century, 17th century painting, Dutch painting in particular. Jan Vermeer is uh, God to me. I learned how to paint in stages and glazes to build up colors, to give shadow, luminosity. Slow learner, but in time, I also developed my own techniques, but essentially based on the, those of the old masters. Can I ask you a blunt question? Sure. Did you make a living by your art? <coughs> no. No. I sold paintings. Um, How did you sell them? Through galleries. I had several shows in galleries, but uh, clearly it was never enough to... Uh, to get by, so I worked at one point for my in-laws, um, helping them with art dealership in, in France and South America, and then just trying to get by. I worked in a public relations firm as creative director, writer, illustrator. I got to meet all the famous cooks and chefs, and that has led me today to um, have- Hi, Wait a second, that was quite a jump. From how did you get to meet chefs? What, what was well in public relations? It was oh, public, I'm sorry, I should have explained. It was cookbook public relations. I see. Okay, fine. Now it makes sense. Go ahead. So I got to speak with Marcella Hazan and Emeril Lagasse, who, by the way, is from Massachusetts anyway. Um, and I just I learned so much about cooking, even though I was a pretty good cook in my own right before that. As an aside, one of the reasons I got the job in this cooking public relations firm is that I had entered a cooking contest and I won the grand prize of $10,000. So it helps when you have a little food background in your, your life. What was the food contest? It was the Build a Better Burger contest for Sutter Home Wines. I entered purely on a whim thinking maybe I could win a local prize of $100 instead of FedEx comes in the mail. And I think I'm, it's probably the government. I've never gotten one of these. This is 1991. And I opened it up, and it told me I was one of the 12 finalists who was going to be flown out to California to compete in this competition. And well, you know, I am really curious about this. I'm going to ask you more. But I have to, op I have to get another show about cooking. Uh, <laughs> Let's go back to art for, today, okay. for now. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of things, there are a lot of pieces to discuss here, and, and I see three different themes, so let's, let's cover them. So the, you told me that the oldest piece is right behind you over there. Mm -hmm. 
I call it the Sentinels. Um, I don't know why sometimes these names come to me just out of out of the air, but they just seem no, like I see it. they were they seem to be guarding the earth in, in a way. Like so many of my pictures, they convey balance and harmony, oftentimes by not looking balanced. But in the end, we'd like to use the word in uh, artistry, architectonic, where the shapes and forms all come together in the end. And it, it's an earlier painting from the 90s, and it's on canvas, which I, I no longer paint on. I paint on panel. Why as, is that? Uh, I'm trying to be truer to the old masters, most of them prior to um, the 1600s painted on panel. If you ever see one of those uh, shows where Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa is taken and it's ripped, it's ridiculous. It's painted on, on a heavy panel that would it, probably 80 pounds. So These when are did, lighter. Wh wh when, <laughs> when, do, when did uh, painting on canvas begin? It was done in the 1400s, but not uh, often because uh, the canvas was very, very expensive. It was only later on when the Dutch uh, began to develop uh, trade with other countries um, using silk canvas, a variety of linens. That's when painting on canvas really came to be more popular. But be it became more popular because it was lighter or because what? Lighter, more workable. More workable. So it's easier to paint on canvas than it is on wood? Uh, for, for many people, yes. Not, not for me. I like the texture of paddle because once I gesso it, I get these particular bumps and lines that give me a direction in a way where I might want to put something. So there's like a, the, you talk uh -huh. about the ghost in the machine. There's actually the ghost in the painting as well that I try to bring out. The ghost is, is in the gesso? It's in the, de in the details. <laughs> in the details, yes. So the sentinels there, well, they, they, there's, a, there's a little path that goes between them that it really invites the eye and, and the viewer to go in. And, and if you look at the background, you know, you can see light in the distance under the trees. What I often said to people, you see these things every day, but you don't pay attention to them. And when I've had people look at my paintings, they say, oh, I know that place. And I'll say, yeah, it's in your mind, because the, it, that does not exist in reality. I put together something that I feel is almost archetypal of what so you... To me, it's a little surrealistic. That's what people will, will say. Some, you know, the funny thing is some people say, oh, it looks so much like a photograph which it's not, and other people will look at a landscape in reality and say, oh, it looks so much like a painting. So I wonder, where's the, where's the uh -huh. middle ground here? Uh -huh. And I think I've tried to grasp that middle ground uh -huh. between. This is the archetypal oh. two trees. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. If I may be so bold. <laughs> well, let's go, there's another set of two trees. It's between us, but I know that, uh, that uh, this will show up on our screen. Um, here are two, uh, two trees in a little bit. Mm -hmm. And some cows. And this again is playing with balance and symmetry and trying. And of course, you know, for me, what really keeps this painting stationary is that it's called Beyond the Clearing. And what's behind it? What do you see? I try to take my viewer into the picture, but then maybe beyond the picture. Let them do the rest of the work thinking about what else there is so that I don't limit my field of vision to just this two-dimensional space, but rather something that invites the spectator to be a part of it. If you notice, um, in none of my paintings, there are people, because the person in the painting is the Is the you. viewer, is the viewer. Mm -hmm. But these cows, these cows are here, and they, and the, oddly, they're not on the ter terrain, they're on the horizon which is, that's another surrealistic kind of feeling here mm -hmm. to me. They, they're not any place that on the horizon. This is like a little odd. Well, I it's, think... Again, it's archetypal cow. <laughs> it's but, but it's I, like I, the, the profile of a cow. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something else that separates my pictures from other people's pictures. Somebody would put the cow here or one up there, and I think, let's put it where you don't expect it. 
I mean, if you, one of the most arresting images in cinema is at the end of The Seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman, where you have people following death along the horizon. And it's a silhouette image and, you know, it's stunning. So why keep things bound to the earth when you could put them in the midground somewhere and take you beyond it? And tell me about that tree that's off to the um, stage right. Well, the same way with the background, it's suggestive. You don't need to put a whole tree to make someone know it's a tree. And that's the thing about the brain, the eye. You don't have to finish a sentence for someone to know what you're going to say next. And likewise, who needs a whole tree when you can put a branch in to tell the rest of the story of the tree? Meaning there are lots of trees up on this horizon. And interpretation is yours. Uh-huh. No, there is something surrealistic about this, definitely. I mean, there, it's, it's very realistic, like a photograph, but there is no photograph like this. No. And I don't even think anybody would take a photograph like this. Well, if they could. <laughs> if, if they could, right, right. It's not that I don't uh, use photographs. I'll make composites and cut and, you know, before they had cut and paste and computers, I would do that in my mind, um, take images from here, there, and then perfect them. Okay, well, what's the, uh, how much time went between that first painting and this one, or that early painting and this one here? Um, about 20 years. Well, 20 years allowed you to get rid of that foreground and the shadow of other trees, perhaps, and the suggestion of terrain, I think and the, the suggestion of a person, because that pathway <laughs> is only made by, well, it could be made by cows, I suppose, but people, I would think. So we're finished with that kind of realism. Mm -hmm. Well, now, um, there are um, there are a few others here that have um, have landscapes in them. Let's do those next. We have three here, one right between <coughs> us that has a landscape. No, let's do that one last. The one above my head here mm -hmm. is uh, a window, a broken window, in fact, mm -hmm. and uh, and a scenery, a landscape scenery behind it. Tell I, me about that. Well, one. I call it melancholy of a beautiful afternoon, which almost seems like a contradiction. I mean, here you have a, a broken window, a landscape in the distance, but it, it, there's, I think there's a wistfulness that we all feel at times, this nostalgia that if you're in an old house, and I'm sure anybody up here has probably been in one of those old farmhouses and you look out the window past the cobwebs and then you see the rolling fields. It's just this dichotomy. It, it's, it's about aging. It's about life. It's about transition. It's about evolution. It's about being part of the past, present, and future. And I think that uh, this particular painting encapsulates that. I think that's really very beautiful. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, here in front of us is a smaller piece. What do we call this one? Uh, that I call this the other room. And um, this was something that is probably the closest to an actual scene um, that I encountered. I was living in Argentina, and I was out in the countryside. And I saw a building where the whole back wall was down. And I looked through the window. And I saw a landscape in the distance. So we're outside, we're outside and we're looking outside. We're outside looking outside. So we're just outside. going, it, for a while it takes, it takes a moment to try to figure out where you are. And this was hanging in our gallery in the Landscapes uh, exhibit. And I would ask people, particularly younger people, I said, can you explain this picture to me? What are we looking at here? And this youngster figured it out immediately. I mean, he figured out the problem. He said, we're outside. The window is propped up by a stick there, the, the, uh, not the window, the shutter. Mm -hmm. And so we've got now an inside and an outside, and they're both outside. Mm -hmm. So let's go inside. Com oh, let's go to this one now, right between us. We're inside. We're definitely inside. Two um, insides here. We're really of inside. Two outside, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we're definitely inside. We're very old masters. 
We're in a still life world. And, and then we have <laughs> half a picture hanging on the wall of an outside. Tell me about this. Well, this I decided that wouldn't it be fun to show um, a pastoral scene, something of the outdoors, in a dimly lit room on, say, a Thursday afternoon. So while you're walking through the room, even though you're entirely inside a house, you have a reminder that there is something else outside as well. Well, now let's move to the, um, <coughs> to the real uh, interiors here. We have here two. And um, can you tell us, just talk if about If we start them. with sealed away. Uh, well, here, I like that because th it, there's a window. We're looking through a door again into mm -hmm. something. Into a closet. And, you know, with that, you know, you don't see the whole door. You don't see the whole interior. There's another closet below. I have one open. So there's the sense that you can see inside at times. Other times it's closed and you don't know what's inside. So it, it's about you know, revelation in a way, not in anything in any stretch of the form religious, but revealing things from within, things that you don't see, but they're there. And, the, and, the, and this marvelous little egg in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. right. let's, let's see, this, this looks so classic. <laughs> well, the uh, red is a little more pragmatic. That was kind of a pay on to my garden. So <laughs> apart from the onion. What do you call this? Uh, red. Red, uh-huh. And I would say that. Red peppers it, red of peppers every kind. Red peppers of every kind, even though there are a couple of uh, uh, scotch bonnets that are orange. But uh, that's more in the Spanish still life tradition of, say, Francesco uh, Zurbaran and a little bit of Dutch below. Yes, I, I very, just decided very to, Dutch. Um, yes. You know, you can't always be uh, crazy Greenfield. and schizophrenic uh -huh. and odd. Uh, I wish I had an hour to talk with you, but we got to go to these. These are amazing. And then we have a last topic to talk before we finish. So let's talk about these. These are not paintings, not oils. These are drawings. We're in a completely different world. Well, based on my studies in art history, I decided to piece together different images from art to come up with an underlying point of view. The Jefferson I call um, self-evident because Jefferson was a slave owner, and I combined his head with one of the most famous sculptures of the 19th century by Hiram Powers called The Greek Slave. So here I have a slave owner atop a slave. You can continue from there. Henry VIII, well, we know what kind of a person he was, especially if you've been watching Wolf Hall, and I combined it with Michelangelo's The, Greek, uh, the Dying Slave from the Tomb of All People, a Pope. And we know about Henry Pope and Anglo. Uh -huh. So uh, there's a lot there, but I won't dwell on it. You do, you do a lot of these, yes? I did a lot of these. Uh, I've gone in a different direction now. Uh, now, I know that you don't earn a living with your art. So tell us about what you do do. Uh, mostly these days, I, um, I, though I do sell paintings, I'm a writer. My cocktail book, Field Guide to Cocktails, is sold over 30,000 copies. Field, uh, field Guide to Cocktails, everything you wanted to know about cocktails, the history of cocktails, food pairing, it's there. It's on Amazon. Buy it. My most recent book is Dam, something we all do, a cultural history of swearing in modern America. And it's a fun, it's not scholarship, but scholarship is there. It's good for a great laugh. And my book that will be coming out, I hope, next year is called Escape from an Italian-American Kitchen, or How I Learned Not to Cook Like My Mother. Long title. Long title, but it's uh, my memoir about learning how to cook in a household where my mother was an assassin in the kitchen. Oh. What, what John Wilkes b did to the country, she did to Italy. I see. But recipes, ideas, trivia, things you never thought of, and it's, it's all there. Well, Rob, these things are so different. How do you explain all your art to yourself? 
uh, you know, well, do we only read one type of book or see one type of movie? It's the same. We have so many different thoughts. I just manage to express them in such a variety of different ways. I don't like to stick with any one thing. Uh, I see myself as being an eclectic reader and therefore as a writer, as a painter, as an illustrator, that is eclectic as well. I mean, to write a book about cocktails, a book about swearing, after having written dozens of articles about art history and iconography and symbolism, and now a book on Italian cooking. Uh, there's no one thing that I really like to see myself saddled with. I, if I may be pretentious, I consider myself something of a polymath in that I am interested in everything. Thank Maybe you. not rap music, but most everything else. Thank you very much. That's but very interesting. Rob Shiriko, this has been really wonderful. What a lovely thing to find out about our neighbors. Who <laughs> knew up in Greenfield? Uh, so um, uh, the show here is called uh, Just Visiting. Chirico was here. And uh, <coughs> we're now at the Deerfield Arts Bank. I'm Jane Treger. Thank you very much for being with us, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>